All right. Words from a little child, right? Good stuff. Welcome to Eastview Christian Church. It's so good to be back with you. I was gone last week preaching at Central Christian Church in Arizona, and I'm so excited that I get to do stuff like that. But I miss you guys when I'm gone. There's nothing like coming back to Eastview. You're my, I say this a lot. There's a lot of other great churches. There's a lot of cool churches in the country, but this is my favorite church. This is my church. So it's good to be back with you guys. I hope you missed me. If you didn't, well, still good to be back. Glad that you guys are here. We're going to be in John chapter 5 today. Open your Bibles to John chapter 5. God is doing some miraculous stuff in this place, and I'm excited that God is just using this time and this period in our church and this study uh, in the book of John to do some mir- miraculous things among us. One of the other things I really love about Eastview is that we like to have fun. So I, want to, I just want to show this. Uh, this is going to happen. This is really going to happen, Okay. Uh, This is going to take place in the sanctuary in the first week of December. Tickets are on sale. We like to have fun. This is just me and Matt on a Tuesday. They just grabbed this and we took some photos. Anyway, uh, just kidding. That's probably airbrushed and we look way better than really. But uh, here's what I want to encourage you about. This is a chance for us to have a cool thing that you can invite your unchurched friends to. They're really going to enjoy it. And it's going to be intimate. It's going to be in the sanctuary. All proceeds of the tickets go to a Haiti Christian Mission to help refurbish and restore classrooms down there for kids down there, plus their dessert. All right? I'm just going to tell you this. There's 2,000 tickets, so you better get them because they're going to go fast. All right? So you guys excited about that? It's going to be so much fun, and, uh, and maybe me and Matt will have some fun while we do that. This is the second Miracle Sunday in a row. You all all right? Okay. All right. Good. This is the second Miracle Sunday in a row. And uh, last week, if you were here, you saw hundreds of people come forward in all four services for our elders to anoint them with oil and pray over them. And miracles are taking place. I want to encourage you through the rest of this month, use the hashtag ECC Miracles so that we can share together what God is doing. And we're praying that God is going to do another miracle today. He's going to break through in our lives spiritually. And he's going to change some of our hearts. And so I hope you've come today um, understanding that this water thing that the video talked about is a reality in the passage we're going to look at today. Jesus was about water. And he talked about water probably because he was himself the living water. So it's not a surprise we come to John chapter 5 today and we find a story of healing. Guess what's involved? Water. It's a famous ancient pool that was in first century Jerusalem, and Jesus does a miracle there in a man who is a paralytic in his life. And so let's read this together. John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Let's let the Lord speak to us today through his word. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which had five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. At once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath day. It's not law for you to take up, lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and he told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us today through his word. God, I pray, I know, I trust that you are at work now, that you are a working God. And you've done your greatest work through your son, Jesus Christ. And so now by your living word, Jesus, I pray that you would work in us. Do a mighty work in the hearts of every person that can hear right now. By your Holy Spirit, not by smart words or great speech, but by your Holy Spirit power, God, would you move and work in us today. If there's anybody in here who is spiritually sick or invalid, can't walk, paralyzed, would you bring walking to their life today spiritually? By the power of your son, Jesus, by the power of your preached word, by the power of your spirit, God, would you work here, now? 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've not been here the past couple of weeks, starting all the way back into October, we said, hey, we're going to create some margin. We're going to create margin in our lives so we can notice the miraculous work that Jesus is doing. Remember, Jesus is always doing miracle stuff. It's just that so often we're too busy to really notice it. And so we come today to this, uh, this place. By the way, I forgot. I was going to tell you the story. Oh, I just got an email before we came to church today. A lady that came forward last week, okay, she, she had some cysts on her pancreas. And she asked one of the elders to pray for healing for her. She had a CT scan scheduled for Tuesday. She went to the CT scan. The cysts were completely gone. Amen? But God does miracles, right? God does miraculous stuff. And that's what we believe that God is at work and that God wants to do miracles in our lives. He's not a God of the Old Testament or back in the olden days he did miracles. He's doing miracles now. And we believe that God wants to do a miracle in us today. Once again, I want you to notice where this takes place. He's in the margin. See what it says there? After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he's just there in the margin. He's just a regular Jewish guy going to a place that's historically known as Bethsaida. Okay? This is a map of Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem, kind of a rough sketch of what it looked like. You can see this is the Temple Mountain. Okay? So the, kind of the enclosure. This is the actual temple itself where the sacrifices and the worship had that took place. Right outside this little gate called the Sheep Gate, by the way, why is there a sheep gate? Well, because they're doing, they're doing sacrifices all the time. You have to have a place to gather the sheep. They can't, they can't come in. Uh, the people that are taking care of the sheep can't come into the temple area because they're unclean. They have sheep outside. They bring them in for sacrifice. They slaughter them. Isn't it kind of interesting that Jesus, the sheep, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world, is hanging out of the sheep gate? I love that, right? But there's these pools out here outside of the sheep gate, the pool known as Bethesda. Bethesda, Beth. Anytime you see the word Beth at the beginning of a, of a name of a city in the Bible, it means house, house of, Beth, house of, right? So Bethsaida literally means Beth Chesed, house of mercy, house of healing. This pool was known historically uh, for a place where people could come. If they got into the water at the right time, they would be healed of whatever infirmity they had. By the way, uh, this is a place you can still go to today. It's really awesome. Uh, apparently, they haven't cleaned the pool in 2,000 years, but we were there a few years back, and that's some of the water that's in the remnants of this huge structure. This is another part of it over here. You can see some of the people going. We're going in 2017, by the way. At the end of 2017, we're taking another trip to the Holy Land. If you want to go stand in holy places, this is your chance. But this is an actual pool. This is not just the Bible. It's archaeology. Pool of Bethesda, it's a real thing. And Jesus, this story takes place with Jesus here at this pool of healing. I love this because Jesus is in the margin of life, but he's with the marginalized. He's with people who don't have advantage. I want you to see Jesus is the son of God in the flesh. He's got all the answers. He should be in the temple teaching. He should be headlining. He should be signing books here in the temple going, hey, let me tell you about God. But he's not. He's outside with the common people. By the way, these people that are on the outside, they're marginalized because they can't go to church. Look what it says in verse 3. It says, the multitudes of people were there that were blind and lame and par paralyzed. They were needing of healing, but they were also needing of spiritual healing because they were separated from their culture. If you had a disease back in the Bible times, you can't go to church. You're unclean. There's something wrong with you. You can't hang out with your family. You can't go into the marketplace. There's something wrong with you. A ton of sick people. And it's during some kind of feast. We don't know which feast it was. A feast of the Jews. Jesus is there. Again, I want to remind you, this is so in interesting to me. A mile by mile square is what Jerusalem was in the ancient times. As many as 250,000 people came for these festivals. So you can imagine how packed it is and how many more people are laying by this pool hoping that they are going to be healed. And there is Jesus in the middle of them. I love this about Jesus. He's not only a Jesus that works in the margin of our life, but he works with the marginalized people who need healing. I want you to see that this passage is about healing. The word healed's all through it. And there are three words that kind of give us insight into what healing really means. There in verse 13, the man who had been healed, that's a word that means instantly cured. So he was lame, and he wasn't lame. It happened instantly. Okay, it's a different Greek word. Then there's a word you'll recognize in verse 10. The man who had been healed, that's a different Greek word, therapuo. You hear the word therapeutic and therapy in it. It's a word that means somebody does something to make you better. 
Right? And the other word, the rest of the time you see healed all through this passage, it's a word that just means to be made whole. In fact, some of your versions probably say to be made whole. It means to be put back together. Something's broken. We're going to fix it. We're going to put it back together. And so there, ha- there are hundreds, maybe thousands of sick people needing to be healed, needing to be better, needing someone to help put them back together. And there's Jesus. And you know what? With all these thousands of people, I love this. Look at verse 6. He saw one. Well, actually, go back up to verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years, and Jesus saw him lying there. I love that. It means that Jesus looked at him, that Jesus made eye contact with him. And I believe uh, that what, this is what God's calling us to as a church at Eastview Christian Church. I think that's what this season of Imagine is all about. Imagine is a chance for us to look to the people around us, thousands of people in this community who don't have enough, who, who their needs are not met, They are marginalized socially, maybe economically, and we have a chance as a church to say during this holiday season, hey, we see you, and we're here to bring you healing. The Lord supplied what we have, so we're going to give it to you. Jesus catches eyes with this guy. He has eye contact. I pray, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to see miracles on the margin, then get with the marginalized. You know where Jesus is hanging out today at church? Out there in the atrium by those snowflakes. That's where Jesus is. Because he knows every one of those names, he knows all of their needs, and today you get a chance to go out there and take care of those needs. May we be the kind of church, fearless followers, that take those snowflakes, pray for those people, see the individuals in the thousands around us. All right? Did you notice that something's missing there in your Bible? Somebody find for me and read verse 4. There's no verse 4, unless you have an old King James Version Bible. And the reason is, is because the oldest manuscripts of the Greek Bible don't include uh, verse 4. Let me tell you what verse 4 kind of says. Verse 4 says that every once in a while an angel would come to this pool of Beth- Bethesda and he would stir up the water. And, and when the water was stirred up, if you got in, first one in, healed. All right? So that was the legend. And you can tell this was the legend because that's what this guy says in verse 7. He says, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water's stirred up. How did he get in the Bible then out of the Bible? Probably some well-meaning monk in the 3rd or 4th century said, hey, I want to give some context to this story. But traditionally, understand, it was, a, it was a, a tradition that was passed on. Everybody in Jerusalem understood it. This is a place where you can be healed, this pool at Bethesda with the magic waters, with the stirring of the angel. But here's what's happening. Nobody was getting healed. At least this man wasn't. People were putting their hope in healing for something that obviously wasn't working. This guy had been at this pool for 38 years, not healed. Isn't it tragic in our lives and in our world that sometimes we trust something to heal us that really is incapable of healing us? How how many of us in here today are probably trusting something to heal us, to make our lives better, to get us to a better place, when in fact, that pool, what that thing we're trusting in cannot heal us at all? Some of us in here are trusting the pool of dating or friendship or being in the right crowd. We're hoping that if we get with the right people, then that will heal us because we'll be valuable, we'll be worthy, someone will love us. And you know what? We go relationship after relationship to relationship. We're not healed on the inside. Some of us in here are trusting that the next raise, the next promotion, the next award, the next accomplishment, the next degree is somehow going to feel, uh, heal that, that insignificance and that, that lack of worth on the inside. You may, some of you older people in here like me, 51 years old, you can tell every award you get, it just, you just go, oh, what's the next thing? Every title you get, it's like, oh, that's cool for about half a second. And it's moving on because it doesn't really heal the deep down need of significance and worth that we all have. Some of us in here believe that the more toys we get, the more money we get, the more we save, the more we buy, the more we see, the more the gadgets, then then we get excited. I got some new shoes. I got some new clothes. I got a new car. And then the new car smell goes away, and who cares, right? Because it's, it's a pool of healing that doesn't really bring us what we're looking for. Some of us are laying by the pool of self, thinking that our inward soul will be healed if we just get to do things our way. If we just do things the way that we feel and the things that make us feel good, we think, oh, that's going to bring, that's all I need. If the people just leave me alone and let me be. But in fact, it makes us lonelier and makes us more um, injured and ill than we've ever been before. If you're hoping or trusting or thinking that anything other than Jesus will be healing for you today, how's that going? 
I mean, this is really an answer. I really want you to answer this question inwardly. If you're here today, especially if you're visiting, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to ask you, what healing thing do you have in your life? What are you trying to get next to so that you will feel good about yourself and that you'll be okay with yourself? How's that going? As you think about that question, I want to consider the question of the day. It comes in verse 6, and it's kind of surprising to me, at least the first time that I read it. I'm like, what? Look at verse 6. Jesus saw him lying there. He knew he'd already been there a long time, and he said to him, do you want to be healed? (laughs) I'm at the healing pool. I can't walk. I've been laying here for 38 years. What do you mean, do you want to be healed? Do I want to get better? What a silly question for Jesus to ask, and yet there's something that Jesus Jesus notices about this man, and I think likely about all of us, is that sometimes it's possible that we don't want to be healed. That Jesus isn't, and and, and here's what I've studied throughout all the years, all my years of studying and preaching, here's what I found out about Jesus. If you don't want to be healed by him, he won't heal you. If you don't believe, because it comes down to belief. That really what he's saying is, do you think that I can do something about your sickness? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to take a step forward? And it's a great question. I want us all to consider that this morning. Do you want to be healed? See, sometimes the sickness becomes who we are, and so we just settle in, and we lay in it, and we own it, and we become it, and it's represented by the bed. Did you notice uh, all the, t- the, just the repetitive nature of this? Take up your bed, take up your bed, take up your bed. What bed? Well, he's probably got a little beggar's mat, um, kind of like those things you, uh, you take to the beach in the summertime, those, uh, those flimsy those straw things that you roll up and you throw away when the vacation's over, or you save them for years and they're tattered, right? If you ever go to a, a bigger city in the, in the wintertime especially, and you see some homeless people or some, some people asking for money on the street, they sometimes are sitting on a cardboard, a piece of cardboard box. If you ever see that, th- that's what this guy is sitting on. He's sitting on some kind of mat. It's a word that just means a mat that you can roll up. And he's sitting in it. And some of us symbolically are sitting in the bed of pain. And maybe we don't want to get well. Some of us in here today are sitting in on the mat of our past. Okay, this guy's been here for 38 years. At what point do you think he stopped saying, I'm going to get healed? I mean, he probably, first day he got to the pool, he's like, this is great. That stirring, I'm in, boom, I'm out of here. Then another year, then five years then 10 years, then 20 years. At what point in the 38 years did this man probably go, I'm never going to walk? He's sitting in his past. He believes that what he's always been is what he's always going to be, and he's never going to change. And many of us in here today, we messed up once. We've sinned in the past. We've got a record. Maybe you did time. Everybody knows about it. People judge you for it. Maybe nobody knows about it, but you know it, and you believe in your mind, that's who I am. That bad thing I did in my past, that bad person I used to be, that's who I am. And you're sitting in it going, Jesus can't change me. Some of us are sitting in the bed of our past. Some of us are sitting in the bed of our pain. See that word there in verse 5 and a couple other places, the word invalid? In the Greek language, it literally means no strength. This man was a no strength. And some of us are in such pain that we don't have strength. We don't have the emotional strength, the mental strength to take a step towards healing. And I will admit, sometimes some of us have been hurt so bad because of some abusive person or persons in our life. Maybe your parents, maybe somebody in high school or college has hurt you deeply and you've got these deep emotional wounds and it may take some Christian counseling, but your first step is to believe that Jesus can do something about it. Some of us are sitting in pain today. Some of us are sitting in um, broken relationships. Our whole life is the testimony. Look at this guy. Isn't this amazing? Jesus says, do you want to get healed? And he he tells him two reasons why he can't. He says, this is like us. I see myself in here. Uh, Jesus says, you want to get well? The sick man answered him, verse 7, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool, and while I'm going down, another one steps before me. Jesus, it's everybody else's fault. There's thousands of people laying around here. They're all waiting for the special stirring from the angel, and every time I'm ready, nobody will help me. No, and, and everybody seems to be against me. And there are other people, there are people like this man in this congregation right now who because of our family upbringing or friends that have forsaken us or church people who have hurt you, maybe even pastors that have hurt you, 
You're like the, lo- the lame man, and you just think of the lonely words. You go, well, that happened, and so I can't. Oh, that, they, that person did that to me, and so I'm a mess. And so I'm, I'm going to blame everybody and everything on where I'm at. Some of you are sitting in the pain of broken relationships. Others, all of us can relate to this, are sitting in the bed of sin. Look at verse 14. It's really interesting. Uh, Jesus found, finds the guy in the temple, and he says to him, see, you are well, sin no more. Now, by the way, I want to show you something that's pretty uh, cool. Um, remember, the guy is out here. He's lame. He can't go to worship, but Jesus finds him in the temple area. You know what that means? It means as soon as that guy got healed, he probably went to the priest and said, I'm healed. Let me in. And he offered a sacrifice, and now he's in the church again. Now he gets to go to worship. Now he gets to be involved in the fellowship of the Jewish people of God. But Jesus finds him, and he says this weird thing. He goes, go and sin no more. Now that you're well, sin no more. Now let's get this clear theologically, what the Bible teaches. Next week we're going we're to talk from John 9. Jesus heals the blind man. And Jesus teaches very specifically, God doesn't zap us with bad things every time we sin. If he did, we'd all be a mess in here today, right? Y'all limp in, you croak in, die in, slink in. Some of you would have died this week. Because you just would like lightning bolt. I, I probably wouldn't be here. Okay? He just doesn't give us pain every time we do something bad. On the other hand, some of the sins we commit bring deep pain into our life. We don't know what this guy was up to. We don't know what his past was. The the Lord simply gives him a warning, says, hey, don't go back to a life of sin because something worse might result of that. Some of us in here today are sitting on the bed of sin. We're lame because of stuff that we've done. We've ignored God and his ways, and as a result, our life is a mess. I gave advice to someone this week. They go, I'm going to do this, and I'm like, the Lord will not bless that. You can do it, and you can think it's cool, but I'm telling you, At some point, God is not going to bless that because it's against his will. He's just not going to bless stuff that's against him. Some of us are sitting on the mat of our own sin today, and we can't move because our sin has literally paralyzed us. And uh, you know what? This guy could have been the same thing. You're lame for so long. You can't walk for so long. It's tempting to get comfortable as victims, to blame others, to look past our part of the pain and part of the sin We don't think it can get better. We don't think it will get better. And we don't think anybody can do anything about it. And so we settle in for a life of lameness on our mats. When I was a youth pastor, I used to tell the students, you're lame. But that's another story, right? (laughs) The question remains, though, for all of us today, whatever mat you're sitting on, whatever place you find yourself in, whatever state of illness or invalid that you find yourself today, the question remains from Jesus, do you want to get healed? Do you want to get well? Do you want to get past your past? Do you want to move away from your emotional pain and guilt? Do you want to heal the relationships with others by healing your relationship with God? Do you want to overcome the sin sickness that has paralyzed you in your life? Here's good news for you today. Jesus can do it. Up until this part of the story, we're we're saving the the climactic ending. But Jesus is looking at a lame man. In verse 7, he goes, do you want to be healed? And he goes, can't do it because this and this and this. I'm lame, dude. And if that was the end of the story, we go, that was a weird story. But Jesus can do something about it. He doesn't ask you if you want to be healed just because he's interested and, and, and curious. He wants to know if you think that he can do something about it. Because here's the deal. He believes that God is at work. If you go from John chapter 5 on through John chapter 10, Jesus is challenging something here. This is the crux of the matter. This is why Jesus was, uh, they begin to want to kill Jesus. Because he's working on what day? The Sabbath day. It's the day of rest for God's people. And all these, these Jewish leaders in the first century had centuries of rules that they had made up and regulations you have to follow. It become ritualistic. John 5 through 10 is Jesus saying, hey, all your rituals, all your feasts, all your worship, even your Sabbath days, I'm not doing away with them. I'm fulfilling them. Jesus actually says in one place, I, the Son of Man, am the Lord of the Sabbath. And then he he blows them away with uh, with some really cool teaching, theology. See, the day that Jesus healed this paralyzed man, this is very important in the story. John includes it into verse 9. Now that day was the Sabbath. 
you just have to understand there's some people who don't want you to get well. There's people around you that you'll mess everything up if you get well. You'll mess up all their theology if you get healed. Because there's a lot of people, even in the church, who want to go, oh, no, God can't change you. God can't heal you. You're not following the rules. You're not doing it the way that I did it. You're not doing it the way I think you should do it. There's a lot of people who want to talk you out of being healed because they don't want you to. These Old Testament dudes, they could, you see the irony of this? Hey, that guy that wasn't walking for 38 years, now he's walking. You know what? He's not going to go to heaven. He's carrying a mat. That's your thinking. They've forgotten what God said in the Old Testament. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I don't care about a million bulls sacrificed on my altar. I'm doing this because I want to show you my heart and mercy for forgiving you. And so when a lame man walks for the first time, that's a good Sabbath day, even if he is carrying a bed. See, Jesus teaches some theology, these Old Testament know-it-alls. I love it. Because even though it's the Sabbath, he makes a point to them. Look what it says in this last verse we read. Jesus answered them, my father's working. Oh, you mean God's violating the Sabbath day? He's working. His point is, God always works. Sun came up today. Who did that? Sun's going to go down tonight. Who's going to do that? Who's going to make the waves go back and forth? Who's going to blow the wind through the trees? Who's going to feed all the cattle on a thousand hills? Who's going to name all the birds in the world and watch them when they fall to the ground? Who's in charge of this world spinning it and keeping it going? God's working right now. That's what Jesus is saying. So if you guys, if you could see God face to face, you'd get in his face and go, you've broken your Sabbath. He's going, it's crazy. And here's what I believe. I love this, this phrase grabbed me from the first reading this last week as I started to prepare this sermon. God is still at work until now, this day. Here at a church in Normal called Eastview Christian Church, God hasn't stopped. He isn't done. His plan isn't finished. No matter what you think about your life or this world, God is still working till now. And he wants to do something in us today, I believe. Listen, I know. I'm not unaware of stuff that happens in our culture. In fact, part of what I do is pay attention to culture. There was an election this week. I know. I know some of you think the sky is going to fall down, and I know some of you are happy about it. And you know what? Here's what I'll tell you happened for me on Tuesday night. There was zero transference of power from God. He's still in charge. He just is. I'm not making light, and, if, and please don't send me any emails about political stuff, because I don't care. I'm in the kingdom of God, and nothing changed. I was telling somebody this week, we think too small when we think the American election is going to change God's stuff. God doesn't have America in his hand. He has the whole world in his hands. It's seven and a half billion people. There's over 190 countries in the world today, and very few of the leaders are Christian. Okay? He, and He's fine. None of them are on the throne or have power without him saying it's okay. And he's going to use, believe this or not, he's done this all the time. He's going to use evil to do good. He's going to turn evil into good. And and so, listen, don't worry. God's in charge. It's going to be okay. And we're still going to watch baseball and eat hot dogs. It's going to be great. Okay? We're going to be fine. But the reality is this world sometimes looks like it's not working, like the culture has rejected God and it's filled with violence and there's injustices of all kinds and we have this murderous attitude that is called selfishness and we have this adulterous feeding of the flesh that we just give everything we want to ourselves and everyone thinks that God is not in charge, but I'm telling you, God is in charge of everything today. He's working till now. No matter what you think about your life, now let's get personal. Because some of you are going, that's cool that he's in charge of the world, but he can't fix me. Whatever you think about your past, whatever you think about your capabilities, whatever you think about how much worth you have or how valuable you are, let me tell you something about your life. The sins you have done, the sins done to you, everything about you, everything that happened to you, God is aware of it, and he's at work today redeeming it. That's what he does. He fixes stuff. And that work was primarily accomplished through the work of Jesus Christ. See what Jesus says in 17? The Father, my Father, by the way, that totally ticked off the Pharisees as well because he's calling him his Father, personal like he's God or something. (laughs) My Father is at work till now, 
And what's that mean for him? So I am working. You see, if God's working, then I'm working. Flashback 18, maybe 19 years. He's in that same temple talking to the Jewish leaders. Remember his mom and dad found him because he didn't make the caravan back up to Nazareth? Not the Dodge caravan, the actual caravan, right? <laughs> he didn't get in with the family? Well, they, what he's, they said, son, why have you done this? And he goes, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? If God's working, Jesus is working. And he's working at this pool of healing because God's at work in the lives of people who are hurting. In fact, Jesus is the work the Father is accomplishing. Jesus is the work of God because he came to establish a kingdom of healing by dying on the cross and taking away our sin and our pain. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's why he came. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came not to, to get the well people. He came to get the sick people and heal them. That's what Jesus is about. And Jesus has been doing the work of his father since he hit the earth, and he did the ultimate work in the cross so that you and I could, could take up our bed and walk. Jesus did the work of all the sin and the death that you've experienced in your life so that you can walk. So if the answer to your question that Jesus asked you this morning, do you want to be healed? If it's yes, there's only one thing left for you to do. Walk. Uh, some of you are sitting in your past. And, and God's saying, stop sitting in your past. It's over. I took care of it on the cross. You don't have to worry about your sins. You are not that person. Some of you are sitting, hoping that somehow miraculously God's going to zap you. You're sitting in bad relationships, brokenness. Some of us are sitting in sin. We've been sitting in it so long, we don't even know it's sin, but we've broken God's will and God's ways. So many times we're just sitting there going, well, it's not going to get better for me because I'm a sinner and I'm just not going to get better. Some of us in here today are sitting in incredible pain. There's a moment where God said, get up. And here's the deal. How did he know he could get up? There's a moment where this lame guy's going, oh, funny joke, Jesus. I can't walk. There's no water stirring here. There was a faith moment where he says, this guy says I can walk. I'm going to get up. Some of you today just need to get up. You just stand up and say, I'm not, I'm not going to stay on that mat anymore. I'm going to roll it up. I'm going to put it on my shoulder. And I'm, for the first time, I'm going to walk. And if you're ready to walk, I'm just telling you, God's ready to heal you. If you're ready to walk, he's ready for you to walk today. And you may have come not ready for this. It's baptism Sunday. It might be scary and churchy to you. And you're going, man, I don't know about today. It'd be like the lame man going, hey, Jesus, could you come back next week? I'm not ready to walk yet. No, he's ready today. We are ready today. We've been praying for you for weeks. We got towels. We got changes of clothes. We got people to pray with you and to help you. Today, walk. Take up your bed and walk. I'm going to ask some pastors and elders to come down here in a few moments. In fact, pastors, elders, go ahead and come to the front. They're here simply to help you do away with your bed, whatever mat you're laying in. They're just going to help you throw it away. And they're going to introduce you and pray for you to Jesus and will help you with your baptism today. Now listen, there's places you can get baptized. You can, you can get baptized over here in our normal baptistry. You can get baptized over here in our portable one. You can go out in the, in the atrium and you can get baptized in the well out there. And people who have like chocolate on their cheeks will clap for you when you get baptized, all right? They'll stop eating their cookies, I promise. And, and we just want to ask you to come. Let this be the day of healing in your life. This is the day to pick up your bed and walk and be healed. As the video at the beginning of the sermon stated, Jesus does a whole lot with water. And he is that living water. And he's saying to you today, come and have some of me. Don't come today to these baptistries. This water, this water is about as holy as the water in the pool of Bethesda. In fact, my favorite joke about being in this town is that's normal water. It really is normal water. 
There's nothing special. It's not sanctified. It's not holy. But when you come to the living water and you place your faith in Jesus, it becomes a holy moment. And you, you represent the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, take up your bed and walk. He wants you to. I'm going to ask you all if you would to stand. And uh, as uncomfortable as it might make some of you, would you just close your eyes? Because we need to pray. We need to ask the Holy Spirit if today's the day of healing for us. Matt and the band are going to sing a song that we wrote about water. Water that will heal you, that will quench your thirst, that will give you drink, that will forgive you, that will start over. And some of you today have answered that question, yes. You're saying, give me this water. Well, today, take up your bed and walk. Some of you in here, you've been walking with Jesus for a while, but honestly, you've gone right back to your mat. Maybe this is a prayer of rededication for you. This is not a song you have to sing. It's a song we want you to pay attention to the words. And as the Holy Spirit moves you, especially if you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, would you come? And would you let us pray with you? And would you let us start the healing process that happens only in Jesus Christ? If you're a follower of Christ in here, would you begin praying right now for all those around you who need Jesus? Don't walk away here today without getting rid of your mat. Come on down and give your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus is asking, do you want to be healed? Let's say yes to him today. Let's let this song be our prayer.